thank you very much, Dr. Alisa. Thank you, distinguished guests and your excellencies on the panel. It's a great privilege to be here this evening. My people, the Jewish people, sing an anthem called Hatikva. Hatikva means hope. Hope against all odds, hope against exile, hope against hatred. And this evening, being a speaker and being a guest at the Muslim World League truly gives me and I think many people a tremendous sense of hope. And it's a great honor to be here with you this evening. I would like to say that the Torah or the Bible traces the lineage of both the Jewish people and the people of Islam as having descended from Abraham. The Torah, the Bible also teaches the clear record of the Islamic peoples who have descended from Ishmael and were granted lands as Paran. These lands are not far from the land of Israel. Judaism and the Bible recognizes the importance and the prominence of Islam as being a monotheist religion and a major influence over all of humanity. Additionally, the dedication to prayer and the inheritance to morality and ethical conduct as espoused by Islam deserves the highest respect and in Judaism there is that respect to Islam. Judaism and the Jewish people have no agenda to proselytize or to convert. The Jewish people recognize and respect every nation's right to develop their own unique relationship to the one God. And this certainly includes Islam. Tonight, I want to speak about anti-Semitism. The, the hatred against Jewish people, the term anti-Semitism was coined in the 1870s by Wilhelm Marr, a German th thinker who was proud of his hatred of Jewish people and he coined the term anti-Semitism. Many people would think that anti-Semitism, the hatred against Jewish people, is a parochial issue. It's a problem of the Jews or it's a problem of the Israelis or the Zionists. But ladies and gentlemen, Professor Elie Wiesel, the Nobel Prize winner and Holocaust survivor, and perhaps the most important witness to the Holocaust, a human rights advocate, active in Darfur, active in Bosnia, active all over the world after he survived the Holocaust and protecting human dignity. He taught that anti-Semitism always begins with Jews, but it never ends with Jews. And if there's one thing that you can remember from what I'm speaking to you tonight, it's this, that anti-Semitism begins with Jews, but it never ends with Jews. That once this form of hatred is unleashed upon society, it knows no boundaries. We saw this at the rise of the Second World War and the Holocaust. The Nazis, Hitler, focused on the Jews, and sort of like the puppeteer focused on the Jewish anti-Semitic tropes. And while people were focusing on the Jews, we saw the devastation, the horrific devastation, not just to the Jewish people, not just the Holocaust, but the destruction of tens of millions of European lives and the infrastructure of Europe. Today, I would argue that the greatest victim of anti-Semitism, of hatred against the Jewish people, are Muslims. And if you think about it, and I'll explain this in a moment, the anti-Semitic reactionary social movements that have gained too much power around the world and use anti-Semitism as the opium for the masses who preach the destruction of the Jewish people, who preach the destruction of Israel, have turned their hatred, their vile hatred on their own Muslims, their own brothers and sisters who are Muslim, as well as other people. So there's an inherent genocidal tendency to anti-Semitism. 
And basically, there's three phases of anti-Semitism, and I'll give you the history of anti-Semitism in a minute, so 60 seconds, so please bear with me. There was the religious phase of anti-Semitism. So when the world, the dominant view of perceiving reality is through the lens of religion, and namely in Europe, in Christ Christian Europe, the perception of the Jew was that they were stubborn and not willing to accept the Christian notion of the Messiah. And not only were they blinded by evil by not accepting the Christian notion of the Messiah, so they could not have personal redemption, they were blinded by evil and could not reach one with God. But there was this belief, and this is where the genocidal tendency comes in, that if the Jews didn't accept the Christian notion of the Messiah, world redemption would not come about. And this is where the genocidal tendency comes in, that people had to be forcibly converted or removed from society in order to, be, to, to bring about world redemption. When the dominant perspective move, moved and shifted from religious views to scientific, biological, and racial definitions of reality, Jewish communities, namely in Europe, but also in other parts of the world, North Africa and the Middle East, communities that have been there for many, many generations, hundreds if not thousands of years, were suddenly perceived as a different race, an impure race, that the Semitic Jewish race was impure and contaminating the purity of the white Aryan race. And unlike the Christian period where Jews could convert to be saved, Race, there was no escaping race in this sort of biologically determined view of reality. So for the white Aryan race and nation to be saved, the Jews had to be eliminated. And this racist form of anti-Semitism culminates in the Holocaust. Today, I think the most dominant form of anti-Semitism or anti-Semitisms is the demonization of who Jews are as a people the delegitimization and the dehumanization of the Jewish people of who they are and where they come from. And this form of anti-Semitism draws on the religious Christian forms of anti-Semitism, the racist forms of anti-Semitism, and the contemporary form of anti-Semitism. And we can trace the importation of European anti-Semitism into the Islamic world into the Middle East by the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928. The Muslim Brotherhood were influenced by the Nazis. They were influenced by the, the forged document, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion is a forged document that claims to report the minutes or the, uh, of a meeting in which Jews were gathered secretly and we're conspiring to take over the world. And as Elie Wiesel teaches us that the Holocaust, hatred, killing, doesn't begin with the railroad tracks and the crematoriums to the concentration camps. It begins with words and ideas. And the words and ideas of the protocols of the elders of Zion that led to the subjugation of Jewish people from European society separated them and put them into ghettos. And from the ghettos, the final solution in which they were systematically exterminated. That document, the Protocols of the, of the Elders of Zion, those ideas laid the foundation for the Holocaust. And tragically, in the name of ridding the Muslim world from outside influences, the Muslim Brotherhood imported this European racist anti-Semitic document and fused it with Islam. And this hatred has played a key role in what we are witnessing, the hatred of the other and the, the, the massacres around the region um, coming from this rejection of the other. And you can go and trace, I won't go into the whole, I have a lot of notes here, I won't go into it because of time, but Hassan al-Banna also meeting with Hitler, inspired by Hitler, and we know that the, the connections are there. 
Said Khatoub, our struggle against the Jews, a seminal piece of work where he takes the protocols of the elders of Zion and, and rehashes it in the name of pushing forward a certain type of future for the Islamic world. Professor Emmanuel Levinas, a famous professor. He was born in Lithuania before the Holocaust. He went to France to study during the Holocaust and he was saved. He became one of the most important philosophers, European philosophers, and brought Jewish ethics into the academy, into the university. His family was annihilated during the Holocaust. Everybody was killed, but he survived in France. And he took Jewish ethics, and I know among Muslim scholars and, and Muslims that these words will also re resonate because of similar beliefs and similar concepts in Islam. He taught that the moment we see our face in the face of the other, the moment we see our face in the face of the other, that's the instant we become human. So for us to be human, we have to see the other. We have to be ethical to the other. And I think this is the important lesson, that the ethics in Islam and the ethics in Judaism and the ethics in Christianity and other religions must lead us to a space where we respect and see the other. And in fact, if we don't treat the other ethically, we diminish ourselves. And I think here is where the Muslim World League and others could play a very important role in bringing people together towards the future. Sheikh Abdallah Niram Darwish once said before his passing that anti-Semitism ought to be fought by Muslims and hatred against Muslims ought to be fought by Jews. And think about this, the responsibility that we ideally have towards each other. And I think on this note, I would call upon people of goodwill to work with leaders of the Jewish community in the United States and in other countries. I think that there are many people of goodwill that be happy and honored to engage in this project for a better future. I also think that many things are happening below the radar that there are good relations emerging with Israel and Israeli actors, and that should be, in my humble opinion, encouraged and allowed to, to, to grow and to become more open. And I think that this openness can lead to the solutions that plague the region. And I think that this would be an amazing moment for innovation and people of goodwill to come together to create a better future. So on this note, I would like to thank very much members of the Muslim World League and especially Dr. Alisa. I wish you great success on your very important journey. And I think it's a journey that many people in the region and in the world um, would benefit immensely from with your success. So I wish you the very best and thank you very much for the honor for me to be here. Good evening, thank you.